Hello. Everybody coming in, we're gonna give it just a few minutes. You might wanna be sure that you mute yourself. And we're gonna have a lot of fun in the next hour. So I wanna welcome everyone to the North American Expats in France Quarterly Financial Forum. This is the third quarter. And uh, this is co-hosted by uh, Brian Dunhill of Dunhill Financial. There's Brian, hands up. And we have special guest speaker, Daniel Tostado, who's our favorite immigration attorney. Hello. And also you see Patty Sadoskas. Mm -hmm. uh, she's working with us to monitor things. So what's going to happen here is um, you're, we're going to have a presentation by each of us. And uh, then... You're going to have an opportunity to ask questions, so we'll have a Q&A. Please put your questions in the chat. Patty's going to monitor those. She may answer some directly, um, but we would like for your questions to be on topic, if at all possible. And this topic is really an interesting one for us because um, we get asked this all the time, whether it's really worth renouncing your U.S. citizenship or not. Um, we, we know that people do this primarily for financial reasons. But, you know, living in France, um, I, you know, I can talk about this all day long, all the benefits of living in France. Uh, first of all, from a financial standpoint, there's the best tax treaty probably in all of Europe between France and the US. And in many cases, a lot of our um, Americans moving over here are gonna pay less tax by living in France than they do in the United States, believe it or not, especially if they're tax resident in certain states. And uh, of course you're improving your quality of life, you're improving your uh, medical care, you've got fantastic um, infrastructure and transportation. There is a lower cost of living here, believe it or not. I know people think that it's more expensive to live in France, but that is not true. I will make a bet that it will cost you half as much to live in France than it does to for you to, to live in the United States. And of course, there's safety and a million other reasons for living here. And uh, I can tell you that I've been here 30 years and I wouldn't trade it for all the tea in China. Now, have I renounced my US citizenship? No, but I am in the process of getting my French citizenship because you can have dual citizenship. And I, what I'm going to do, though, is first we're going to let Brian Dunhill um, open this up and talk a little bit from a financial side. And then Daniel's going to get on. And we're going to talk about the immigration side. And then we're going to open it up to a Q&A. And I'm sure that we're all going to have commentary along the way. So thank you, Brian. Thank you so much, Adrian, and welcome, everybody. I, I hope that Adrian and Daniel will take part in the conversation as, as we go along, because this is one of those uh, hot topics. And Cam, if we can go to the next slide, um, one of the reasons why it has actually been one of the hot topics is the number of people renouncing their, their citizenship has increased significantly. Um, you'll see the, the, the trend over the last 15 years has been uh, an increase in... A lot of that correlation really comes about because a lot more people are getting roped into the system when it comes to FATCA um, and uh, uh, being wrapped into the American system. Uh, these are mostly uh, considered what are called accidental Americans, people that were born on American soil but haven't really ever lived there or were born with an American passport and don't have any affiliations. Um, they're finally getting roped into the American system, and it's appropriate for them to potentially give up their citizenship because they don't have any real ties to America. The Brian, majority... can you just quickly explain FATCA? Absolutely. I mean, we talk about that all day long, so we know what it is, but not everybody does. Absolutely. Uh, FATCA was a, a rule that came about in 2010. It finally got uh, approved into law in 2011. And from a simplicity vantage point, um, what FATCA says is that a country that signs it, and I believe there's around 70, 72 countries that have signed it, um, they will disclose the information on Americans that live in those countries. And in return, America will disclose the information on uh, those citizens that live or have accounts over in America. So it basically means that there's no longer secrecy between countries. 
So if you have a bank account in France, the Americans can figure out and learn about it. And if you have investment accounts in America, the French can learn and uh, uh, find out about that information under the uh, pretense of FATCA. Now, a lot of banks and businesses have decided to not do business because of FATCA, because the punishments are so severe if they get different aspects wrong. There's nothing in the FATCA rules that says they can't do business. It's just that if they don't disclose things properly, they can get in a lot of trouble. And when I'm talking trouble, straight to the bottom line, um, it's an economical trouble that they can get into. Um, in but do you think that's one reason that um, Americans are choosing to renounce their citizenship? Fact is part of it. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. There's there's more of a way that people can get roped into the American system. Um, the rules for PFIX and for F bars date back to the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So that none of those have changed. But it's the ability of people to get caught because of FATCA that's increased significantly. So therefore. Um, they're wanting, the banks are wanting them to follow the rules and people are being forced to follow the rules. Um, so those become those biggest issues. And in the last 15 years, the numbers don't lie. People have been uh, renouncing their citizenship, as you can see from, from that, that, uh, that graph. The majority of the people on this call don't fall into that category. Uh, they're tried true Americans that are moving or have moved to France. Um, and that's who we really want to reflect upon uh, today, because I would venture to say that the majority of you will have more benefit by keeping your American citizenship instead of um, giving it up. Why was there such a jump in 2019, 2020? Uh, I believe that that was the year that they the year before they increased the fee significantly. Um, that's going based on memory because that feels like a long time ago, but it went from, a, I think, around 1,000 to where it is now, which is around 24, 2,500. The fee to, to do the renouncement. To, to, to renounce, correct. Um, which actually, Cam, I think the next slide you actually show, there, there you go. It's at 2,350, and the rest of the bubbles are telling you how much it is to renounce your citizenship from other countries. So. Uh -huh. If there's not a deterrent uh, that, that's convinced you yet, well, we haven't gone through many of them yet, um, but here's one. It's one of the most e expensive countries to renounce your citizenship from. Um, but Brian, just to jump in here, you say expensive too, but it's roughly $2,000. 2000 yep, 2350 plus potentially an exit tax. Okay, and how much does that come out to? Well, the exit tax, only affects people that have a net worth over $2 million. So if if you're under $2 million, you don't have to worry about the exit tax. Um, it's if you're well over it, you might want to consider some planning before you give up your citizenship, mm -hmm. or if you're going to go through it, that's the time that you want to consider relinquishing your citizenship. It's kind of like planning for French inheritance tax. <laughs> it, it, it's exactly that way, because gifting away money or or... Spending down assets, selling down assets can be some of the best strategies to to reducing uh, your estate uh, from that vantage point. But that's to where that $2 million net worth is the interesting time where you want to consider, will I give up my citizenship ever in my life? This is the time that I should consider it because it will be easier to give it up um, while you're under $2 million in assets than if you go over. Because how they compute that exit tax is they basically take a snapshot of what your net worth is at that time, and they consider that you've realized all those capital gains at that time. So it can be very costly if you have a lot of low basis stock and the likes, and you have a higher net worth. Um, so you don't want to go into that blindly, um, especially if you have a spouse that's not relinquishing or not American that you have uh, the ability to gift some money to. So several strategies to to try to get around that. But I don't think most people fall into that category in any way, shape, or form. Okay. As Adrian was pointing out, we have, or and, and what Jonathan calls it all the time, the bee's knees of, of double taxation <laughs> between the U.S. 
and yep. uh, and France. Um, this is one of the reasons uh, you, you brought it up uh, while, while we were uh, talking before this webinar. Um, we have such a good double taxation agreement that going from citizens-based taxation to residency-based taxation would actually not help the majority of retiree Americans that are in France. Simply put, because most Americans that live in France and are retired are paying all their taxes back to the United States. And it's cheaper for them to do so. So to keep that bee's knees, if you go ahead and turn in your U.S. citizenship, you're relinquishing some of your rights of using that double taxation agreement because you're going to have more income in France or you're going to be getting some of that income out of the United States. I hadn't thought of that before this at all myself, okay, because I've been I'm a proponent for residency based taxation, but from the point of view of an American, not the point of view of an American living in France exactly. I'm I'm a proponent of it for most people that are in the working class to simplify their life. But I don't necessarily want it for um it usurping parts of the double taxation agreement between the US and France. Right. So we, we yeah. have to be careful what we're proponents of. And if, if let's let's just say if you're a retiree that's in France that gets all your income from an IRA and Social Security, all of your income's on the US side. Even if we went to residency based taxation in most countries, you would still have a US tax obligation, even if we went to residency based taxation. So Life isn't isn't that simple unless you spent your entire life outside of the United States. And that would be the same for most other cultures as well. If, if, a, if a Brit moved over to France, they'd still have a UK tax liability if they have their UK uh, uh, retirement accounts and their UK um, uh, sure. government pension coming from over here. It's just a part of being cross-border. So... These tax treaties are something we really want to make sure we take advantage of and we don't we don't uh, give them up. Um, the one that most people overlook is actually the changes in estate taxes. Uh, estate taxes being when you pass away. France has a lot higher estate taxes uh, than the United States. Uh, the, the US is really quite generous. Uh, with an exemption of over $13 million for each individual. So a married couple could essentially have nearly $27 million worth of, of uh, tax reduction, <clears throat> uh, tax exemption when it comes to their U.S. estate taxes. That is for anybody that's an American citizen. If you turn in your American citizenship, that changes from having $13.5 million all the way down to 60000 now, that 60000 counts towards any U.S. situs assets. Now, this might be a, a term that you don't use on a, on a regular basis, but essentially U.S. situs assets are any assets that they're property in the United States. So if you have a home in the United States, that's definitely U.S. situs. If you How have do you a spell that, Brian? Oh, you're you're going to be testing my 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 skills right there. I, I don't know this term, and I'm I I have to assume a lot of people out there don't. Absolutely. I'm assuming I'm assuming it's Latin based, so that'd be S I T O S I T U S S I T U S. Okay. Yeah. So, um, like, like the situation, the location. He, it's always good to have a lawyer around because you're going to get the Latin part. Yeah, we, we definition. And it's always good to have the idiot around so she can ask the right question. <laughs> Not at all. We brought Brian on board. Yeah, for you and me, Adrian, to have a <laughs> bit of a counterpart. <laughs> um, now, any retirement account in the U.S., if you have an IRA, that's going to be a U.S. situs asset. And it's very easy to go over that $60,000 limit. But the one that concerns me the most is U.S. stocks that are not in a vehicle are going to be U.S. situs assets. So let's say you bought NVIDIA or Amazon or Apple way back in the day, and you have a large concentrated position. You're, you may be well over that $60,000 limit um, with that security 
and yet you're going to be exposed to U.S. estate tax for everything over 60000 So it becomes very risky to give up your U.S. citizenship if you have a large estate that you can't easily get out of the United States pre-mortem. And that's why we really want to be careful with, uh, with giving up our citizenship too early without examining how it's going to affect your tax life during, during your life, whether it actually changes your tax position because of where your income is while you're living, and then post-mortem when you pass away, for most people will actually have a negative ramification. Okay. Next slide. Well, at this point, I want I want to kind of dialogue with uh, with Daniel on and 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 yourself, Adrian, on um, some of the different aspects of um, how we want to think about giving up our citizenship or, or such. Um, Adrian, would like would you like me to take from here? Or would you like to talk about the positive? Yeah, no, take it take time? take it over. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm coming to this from the perspective of immigration law, that we have the obligation of having at least one nationality, that we cannot make ourselves stateless. So you cannot renounce U.S. citizenship and just kind of be a floater. Um, that we have to have acquired a secondary nationality before we can consider renouncing any kind of U.S. nationality. And there are plenty of um, nationalities that are you know easier to purchase, so to speak, uh, you know, Antigua and, you know, Malta and a few others where, you know, there's some amount of like a commercial exchange, you put in some kind of investment in that country and then you can buy their passport. Um, but when it comes to France, and, you know, I think of France as being one of the most desirable nationalities to acquire. It's um, not one of those though, is it? <laughs> no, yeah. France has such a high opinion of itself that it cannot be bought. It doesn't let itself be bought. There is no golden visa for France. And there's no easy way for us to get nationality. We're seeing that with Adrian's case file, you know, in live, you know, the difficulties, just, just how many obstacles we have to surmount to get to nationality. Um, but that once we have it, it's really advantageous in my book. It lets you um, be able to vote here in France, national, uh, local, and European, having a permanent attachment to France, so being able to belong here, being able to sponsor a future spouse and minor children to have, uh, you know, um, eventually file for naturalization on their own behalf, um, to be able to move around the 27 EU countries, taking a job tomorrow if you wanted to, and the most important aspect, which is getting in the good line at the airport. So for us, <laughs> for us to, as Americans, to become French, it's a real, um, yeah, it's a real feather in our cap. And then, you know, I was able to naturalize last year, so now I'm a Franco-American. Um, and if I were to like, look back and say, okay, well, now that I'm French, am I going to, you know, cut the plank behind me and, you know, only be on the French side. I, I made a little list on, in my, in, in, on paper of what those implications would look like. So just from a practical standpoint, if you want to go back to the United States and spend more than 90 days, you're going to be limited. You might have to get a visa to be in, in the U.S. for more than 90 days. Um, so like, let's say that you have the intention of losing your U.S. nationality, but you've got a mother or a father or a brother that's sick and you need to spend more than three months. Well, as an American, we could just fly right back over there tomorrow and do what our thing is, you know? But if we're reducing our own rights by giving away our own US nationality, then uh, we, could, we could get stopped at the border. Um, you know, Brian and I were talking before this call uh, started about the Reed Amendment, which is a 1996 um, law that got passed on the US side in which the US government can menace to block your entry, to block your re-entry into the United States if, uh, if you have renounced your own US nationality. And so that as a hypothetical risk is there. Um, then there is, you know, the, the, the left hand throws that life throws you when it comes to um, what your plans are and then what you end up having to do afterwards. So like, let's say you out of the sudden, out of the blue, get a really interesting job offer in Seattle or, you know, Hawaii or what have you, and you want to go ahead and take it. And you hadn't considered this as a possibility, but now it's on the table. Well, yes, as an American, you can fly back tomorrow, take that job tomorrow and do our thing. If we're no longer Americans, we've just cut the cord from the U.S. economy. You know, and so we're, we're limiting ourselves in what we can do. Um, on the civic side of things, it's having a say in U.S. elections. So uh, I don't know about the listeners, but I deeply care about what's going to be happening this November. Um, 
And I take out everybody, <laughs> please. <laughs> and and when we think about uh, other models, like for example, the UK, where if you're outside of the UK but as a British citizen, they don't let you vote back in the UK because you're not a resident there. As Americans, we are allowed to vote from a distance, you know, and that's been a tradition going back to the Civil War. Um, and so what we have are voices that counts, and that still counts on the U.S. side. And yeah, I deeply care about what's happening in America, even though I left it, you know, eight years ago. What do you have, Adrian? This. That's my absentee ballot, <laughs> ready yeah. to be mailed in. Well, for the state of California, they make us fax the uh, vote in, which blows my mind that in 2024, we're still talking about faxing. And so now there's a service set up where I email them my ballot and then they then fax it on my behalf to the California, uh, you know, to the county of San Diego. Um, if I'm already emailing it, then why don't we just cut cut to that? Um, but yeah, being able to participate in the democracy. Um, you know, I also do a vote here in France. That's uh, We've had a, a couple of surprise elections here in France, so I've been able to use that um, power of democracy. Yeah, but earlier than I thought. And maybe that could seem unfair. And I could, I could see that argument. You know, if you've got two nationalities, you can kind of double dip, you can vote in two countries. But the reality is I've got two belongings. I belong to France because my life's here, my wife's here. We're about to have a kid here. We own a property here. My law practice is here. But I am American. I was born and raised in America. All of my family is there. So I'm not just any one thing. I am Franco-American. That's my life now, you know? Um, so I wouldn't want to be rejecting the civic side of things. And then lastly, just in terms of what America put into me as a product. Uh, on the U.S. side, it costs $15,000 per student per year to put somebody through um, K through 12 school. Um, you know, the what we pay as Americans in national security, it costs $2,000 per person per year. To cover the cost of police and firefighters is $600 per person per year. So there's a certain amount of investment that my birth country put into me, making me the final adult product that I am, that were I to say for the reasons of taxes that I find taxes too high, so I'm cutting the cord with the United States. Um, yeah, I, it would really give me reserve to ever make that kind of decision. Um, so I'm glad that America allows for multiple nationality and glad that France allows it. And that's the best fit for me. Daniel, do you feel any more or less of an American living in France? Um, I think of it in the way that the love you might have for your mother is not going to be the same love that you have for your wife. But that one love doesn't reduce the other love. So um, if we're talking about feeling less American, I think at a certain point where I reflect back, when I look back, when I talk with my siblings or whatnot, and I realize that the experiences that I have had makes me no longer just American. Like you can't put me back in that box anymore. I would have a really hard time going back to America, I think, and living there and dealing with private healthcare and you know, healthcare not being a human right and all the various aspects that we love about France. Um, yeah, I don't know if I answered that directly though, Adrian. No, but I, but no, I'm just, I'm asking that because I feel like, I certainly don't want to go back to the United States and live there, okay? Mm -hmm. But I actually feel more of an American by living in mm -hmm. France. Well, you're, like, you are an ambassador as such. Well, yes, but I, it's like I care even more about what happens than I did when I was living there and just mm -hmm. part of the whole, you know, just one of the bunch, sort of, so to speak. Does that make any sense whatsoever? I, no, it, it, yeah, and maybe, you know, if you're actually living in the United States, you care more about the day to day because that's more directly impacting you. Um, but I don't know, like, I feel like our heart is big enough to care care about more than one country at a time. Um, I think I was a whole lot less aware. Living mm -hmm. in the United States, living in that bubble with blinders on, I was certainly a lot less aware of of the bigger picture than I am living in France. No question about it. And seeing the differences. <laughs> But you also uh, moved before 9-11. And I think that was one of those various factors that really opened our eyes as Americans, where if like pre-9-11, we were Americans with our eyes towards America. And post-9-11, we were Americans with our eyes towards the world. Um, and like America and America's okay. place in, in a context. Um, uh, there was someone that was making fun of, uh, my French colleagues were making fun of Joe Biden the other day, because it was on um, September 10th and they asked him, what are you gonna do tomorrow? And he said, I'm gonna do 9-11. Um, and my French colleagues found that a relatively absurd answer and I kind of felt like well actually you know as an American 9-11 is such an event it's so like, foundational it's, it was such a heartstring moment that right. yeah it is an event in and of itself so I suppose uh, you know for those that are listening that 
a lot of my arguments are more, more like the pathos, emotional based you know, reasons for why one would not want to renounce uh, his citizenship. But when we talk about immigration law, we're talking about belonging. You know, do I have the right to be here? Do I have the right to work here? Do I have the right to move around? Um, and the foundation of why we pass these various immigration laws, why the United States and France allow dual nationality is for cases like us and like our clients. Well, I get asked very, very often, someone who says, oh, I want to, I'm going to move to France and I'm going to become a citizen in like, you know, real soon. I'm going, no, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not going to happen that fast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My red flag is when they ask for the passport, because that's almost like they're asking for like the airport side of things, you know, like the facility to come and go as you please versus asking for nationality, which is to say belonging to the nation, to belong to France. Um, Cause you know, the shorthand way of saying it is for naturalization, they require five years presence, the center of your economic and familial interests in France, which is to say if you have a job, it's here, spouse, kids here, that you work for at least 18 months in France. You've got a now level of B1, so you need to be B2, level of French, which is advanced intermediate, that you're not a criminal. Um, and that three years of good tax returns, all of those factors are just the prerequisites to submit a naturalization application. And then as we see in Paris, it takes on average 18 months in the south of France, it takes four years for this to get processed. So by the end of it, you might be nine years into your stay here in France before they land, let you finally join the club. Well, and then they're going to interview. I know they're going to interview me and ask me all sorts of questions that I'm going to have to answer correctly. And I've already, I have a note to myself, I better learn the Marseillaise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I heard of what I heard one legendary um, naturalization interview where the interviewer asked the person to sing the Marseillaise and they stood up and they sang the first verse and the interview was over. The person was just convinced that they had become thoroughly Frenchified. Thank you for that. That's exactly what I needed to hear. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, just don't try to translate what the words mean in the Marseillaise. It's very bloody. Yeah. Yeah, because, yeah, I'm not going to want to know what it says. <laughs> yeah, may the blood of my enemies run in like the, the sills of my field. Kind of oh, yeah, march on, march on. Here we <laughs> yeah. go. Uh -huh, all through the blood. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Daniel, quick question. Yeah. Well, congratulations of, of joining, well, soon to be joining the, uh, the, the, the Club of Fatherhood there. Um, Thank you. Now, essentially, with your American citizenship, you'll be able to pass that on. Yeah. Um, so the way that this then works in American giving birth in France is they register the birth as a consular birth abroad with the U.S. Embassy here in Paris. Um, and then that kid will be American. The reality is then for that child to pass on U.S. nationality to their future kids, that child will have to have, have, to have spent five years on U.S. territory, which I think is totally fair game. It's an Americanizing thing to live on U.S. soil. Um, so, of course, if they ever give birth on the United States soil, that, that's birthright. The kids automatically my future grandchildren, I'm 35, I'm talking about my grandchildren. They will be, uh, you know, once again, uh, holding onto the American tradition of being American. It's all very speculative. If we're talking about what my future grandchildren in 2060 will be like and uh, which nationalities will be the good ones. And uh, maybe we'll all want to be Singaporean, who knows? No, but that's actually a really good question because if you did not have your French citizenship and your wife did not have French citizenship, then the child would not be French. Not at birth, no, because North right. America and South America has a lot of birthright citizenship as the basic rule if you're born on that territory. Uh, it's called use solus, the right of the soul, um, versus uh, by blood, use sanguinis, by, uh, transmitted through uh, filiation, by parenthood. Um, and so that kid could theoretically, at age 13, get citizenship on their own two feet, having been born and educated in France without either one of the parents getting naturalization. As this happens, my uh, future son will be born French, American, and German, and just have to ask to contact the right embassies and ask for the right documents. Oh my goodness. Okay, so, but that's why there are so many accidental Americans, because they might have been born in the United States, were immediately American just because they were born on that soil, right? Even though their parents were not American. Yeah, and I think that goes back to the point that Brian was making about the sympathy for the accidental Americans. You know, people like Boris Johnson, he was born in a hospital in New York City. Is he American? Well, technically, yes. But, you know, in terms of his colors, he's very, very much British. And so I think that's where there's a fair amount of sympathy and where renunciation of U.S. citizenship makes sense to say they never had that sense of belonging. They were never educated on the U.S. side. They don't really care what happens in U.S. elections because they don't esteem themselves to be American. I think in their case, that makes sense to renounce U.S. citizenship. And he still has to turn in a tax return every year. He right. Renounced. Otherwise, he's not tax compliant. He, he he renounced after he sold his uh his his um mansion here in uh in London. 
And uh, then after getting a huge tax bill, he decided that was enough. So. Okay, well, that might make sense. I, I think we can give up Boris Johnson. <laughs> who, 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 who do we get in the trade? <laughs> Uh, we we got a few football stars to be named later for the MLS. Yeah, there you go. Victor uh, Wembyama, the new French uh, basketball star. We can take him on. Perfect. <laughs> That's great. Um, I love this question that Robert's put in the in the chat. I'm I'm just going to kind of jump around. Um, if you give up citizenship, uh, would you also be giving up social security rights too? Um, this is one of those fallacies. You don't. Uh, most countries, you won't lose your social security in those countries. Um, some countries like the UK, you actually lose the the opportunity to inflate it. But in the United States, you don't. It doesn't matter if you're a citizen or not. Um, if you paid into the system, you'll get paid out the same exact way as, as you paid in. Um, you might not get the automatic notifications because they might have a harder time figuring out where you are. But if you contact them, you'll get it for sure. So uh, don't don't play into those fallacies at all. Um, um, go ahead, Danny. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to say there are some really interesting questions uh, in the Q&R, and for everyone that's watching, feel free to pose uh, extra questions in there, because I, I think everyone that I've seen, I've seen four so far, and they're all interesting. Um, so one was about dropping Medicare. I can talk intelligently about that unless you'd like to, Brian. Please, please do. Yeah, so um, from what I've learned about um, U.S. health care, um, of course, I've been, more, I think, more an adult now in France than I am in, in America. And I think my job in part is to be the adults of, uh, in the lives of my clients. Um, so enrolling in healthcare in France, it's a, a human right, um, a very crazy notion. And that what you get is the carte vitale, which you can then um, benefit from, from public health care. And that includes every category of visa, including the long stay visitor visa, which the majority of Adrian's clients are on that long stay visitor visa. Um, on the U.S. side, from what I've understood, and anyone in the chat can correct me, that there's a Part A and a Part B in terms of Medicare, that uh, one is paying into the system, and there's a way of opting out of at least one of those parts, such that, um, you know, for myself, I moved here when I was 26 years old. I am not insured health-wise on the U.S. side, and that's okay, because when I fly back to the United States, I just take out a travel insurance to cover me, and that's a lot more affordable than maintaining uh, medical coverage in the United States for 12 months out of the year living yeah. here in France. The United States having the highest level of health coverage costs in the world. I do the same thing. I don't think that I pay into Medicare at all. Because I'm, I mean, if I go to the States, it's for one or two weeks a year. Right. So, yeah. Interestingly, though, my um, health care, my mutuelle here in France will cover any emergency situation in the U.S., but at French rates, right? <laughs> it's the scheduled rate, which is one tenth of what the U.S., so it's not going to sure. do much of anything. But um, I find that I just take out medical, um, you know, travel insurance, and it's very inexpensive, quite honestly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um one of the other questions was about having protections that you're might be losing, so to speak, uh, with regards to the embassy in case there's situations. So here, uh, living as an American in France, uh, I encourage you to register your presence with the U.S. embassy. They do these little alerts. Sometimes it feels like every Saturday they send out a new alert, like heads up, there's a protest at Place de la Concorde. Oh, they like, scare, they just, all they do is scare you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's good to know that. And sometimes they tell you like, it starts at 2 p.m. They go from Nation, they end at Bastille. You're like, okay, I'll see you there. Um, but, yeah, uh, but they're designed to also, you know, uh, make sure we stay safe. And so they tend to instill fear. Yeah, yeah, it's like your parents. You know, it's yeah. Um, and it is true. Yeah. If you're no longer a U.S. citizen, you know, how could you benefit from the U.S. embassy in Paris if you are happen to be in France and a situation happens? Now, when you have dual nationalities, you, like I, as now a French citizen, cannot run to the French embassy in Washington, D.C. and say, hey, protect me from these vicious Americans because I'm also <laughs> sitting in, in the United States. So you can't do that in the same country where you are. But if you're, you know, you know, if you're Jason Bourne, you're here on French territory and you need a protection, you could run off to the U.S. embassy. Um, and seek protection there, and you would lose that benefit if you lost citizenship. I, I see a question here about green cards. Do you see that? We have green cards, we'll have to relinquish those. We will have to pay exit tax, and they have a 401k, and how will that be taxed in the future? Yeah, and that's a tax question. I don't know if uh, we don't have Jonathan on this call to, to jump in on that part. 
so so it, it, it works a little bit differently um, when relinquishing a, a green card because uh, it's coming to term. You're not you're not a citizen in any way, shape or form. Um, so so essentially, I'll put that to the side because I don't know your full situation, et cetera. But feel free to drop me a line and we can talk about your full situation um, without uh, a, a couple hundred people in, in the background. Um, when it comes to the 401k, you're going to want it to be taxed in the U.S. instead of France um, because it's a U.S. asset. But you're not going to want to die with that asset because you'll lose that um, that privilege of of having the higher estate tax limitations. So it's kind of going to be playing that Goldilocks channel of not taking too much out to where you force yourself into a higher tax bracket on the U.S. side, um, but getting it all out of there uh, to get it off U.S. soil before you pass away. Um, and it's just building a strategy to that. And it's good to note for green card holders that, that in terms of residing here in France, they're treated effectively as Americans, that uh, in France and across the globe, if you are a U.S. national or U.S. green card holder, you still have to file taxes every year. Mm -hmm. And I find on the French side of things, it's relatively similar, that we file in France roughly in April, just like in America, and that the calendar year is the tax year, just like in America, January through December. So it's not too hard uh, to miss to miss filing taxes. There is an expectation if you're living here for more than half the calendar year to file taxes, that I'm generally not afraid of it. Um, of course, I'm just channeling what our various tax experts are saying now, that what you end up declaring on your US, on your French tax return is revenue earned in France, and uh, worldwide earnings, we're talking about revenue, salary. Uh, but that what Jonathan Hadid has told me is that what stays a U.S. taxable event is um, uh, rent, capital gains, U.S. Social Security. So it still will stay on the U.S. side. And it very well could very well be that you come here, you retire to France, you fill out a French tax return, and at the amount of zero is indicated on the French tax return. And that would happen year after year after year. A nice big fat zero. Yeah, exactly. Debbie's, got a, Debbie's got a great question. Uh, Medicare is taken out of Social Security. So how do you stop that? It's actually really easy. You just call the Social Security office. Um, there's a there's an office right there in Paris and um, uh, you contact them. You essentially say that you want to opt out of Medicare Part B and they will remove it and you'll no longer have that expenditure. So I love this question. Just to be clear, if you're living in France, but not as a citizen, do you get full medical coverage just as a citizen would? Do you want to answer that, Adrian? I can, if you like. Sure, you answer it, but I can yeah, answer exactly. it too. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the CART Vital covers the first 70% of medical expenditures. Um, and then what you can do on top of that is get what's called the Mutuelle, which is a top-up insurance. Uh, mine has this little friendly bear character on it, Alan. Um, and uh, a medical, a doctor's visit now in France costs 30 euros. So that means that if you had just have the carte vitale, you're paying nine euros out of pocket. Otherwise, if you get the mutuelle, it covers a full 100% of the costs. Um, and then if we compare that with US co-pays, uh, which might cost 40 or $50, that all of this sounds very affordable. Um, oh, you pay it, for it out of pocket. Listen, here's what they have to understand though, Daniel. That when they apply for a carte de séjour visiteur, just a visitor card, basically France is saying we accept you and we're going to cover you for medical care because it is not a privilege, it's a right. Isn't that correct? Yeah. And do that 70%, but if you have a long-term illness, they'll cover you at 100%. Right. And yeah, it's amazing. And I have a mutuelle, which is, you know, the top up insurance. Um, I'm old. OK, I have the best policy that there is. And it costs me well under two thousand euros a year to have that. And what I figured out last year when I did the math was that what I saved by using the French system, the, you know, that was just granted me. Right. Is what my mutuelle cost me. So it's like a watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I compare it with my uh, brother-in-law. He's Scottish. He moved to the United States and he pays, um, he does Ironman competitions and he pays $16,000 out of pocket for his private U.S. insurance. That's more expensive than any of my retirees who are 80 years old making the trip here to France. So, oh, man, it's insane. you know, like, and there's no uh, pre-existing condition exclusions on the French side. There, the idea is that anybody living here in France for more than 90 days has a right to health care and that includes students and visitors. And of course, it's France. It's going to take several months to get the carte vital. Um, you know, there's bureaucracy. Right, so it just doesn't um, land on your door immediately. Uh, no, no, it's not Dubai. There's not instantaneous anything. There's no expediting in this country. Um, it's a different pace of life, of course. But that um, 
once you're in the public system here in France, you can drop any kind of private coverage and just be living here on the public uh, coverage. Well, and it's so inexpensive. I swear every time I that, you know, you go to get, get x-rays and they say, OK, there'll be 38 euros. I start to laugh. And then they then they they think I'm like upset that it costs so much. And they and, <laughs> and then they start apologizing. I'm going, you don't understand. If I were doing this in the States, this would not be 38. It would be 380. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I, I think one of the songs that we're both singing, Adrian, is that um, one of the sweetest of spots to be in is being an American living here in France. Like we're not calling anybody to renounce their U.S. citizenship to be able to profiter pleinement, to make the most of their experience here in France. That we have a really good Franco-American tax treaty that protects your interests, protects you from double taxation. We've got good health coverage in this country. And it's France. It's an access point to Europe. So you can have, I would almost say like the best of both worlds. You can have your Americanness, you can bring your culture and your personality to this country, and then you could find a good place for yourself within France. Well, there's no question. You know, Patty and I, um, we uh, participated in an international living conference in Portugal in April, where they presented four, five countries in Europe, okay, as possible places to, to move to. And it was Portugal, Greece, Italy, Spain, and France. And after mm -hmm. we heard everyone else's presentations, Patty and I were sitting there going, oh, no contest. <laughs> Absolutely no contest. Because really none of the other countries could offer such a sweet package that France has. You know, from the infrastructure to the tax treaty, to the medical care, to every aspect of the quality of life here compared to there, including cost of living. Mm -hmm. Completely true. I, I, I had a conversation with somebody this week that wanted to move to Italy from America. By the end of the conversation, we were trying to convince them to go down to the south of France and just drive over to Italy when they want to get a good Italian meal. Well, you know my joke, Brian. I wrote about it recently. It's called, you go to Italy to eat and then you go home to France, okay? Exactly. <laughs> because um, after, especially after my one week stay in Sicily, which was like Italy on steroids, uh, the chaos and the anarchy is just overwhelming. I mean, nothing gets done. <laughs> we love Italy. The food is fabulous. I can drink Italian coffee all day long, you know, but um, mm -mm. Well, I have bad news for you, Adrian. The price of coffee in Italy is going to double this year. Why? Because well, <laughs> the, price of, the price of coffee has increased significantly the last year with all the inflation, but it's set by the government and they're finally re letting them readjust the price of coffee. So, oh, you know, those, no. those little, well, as you call them, noisettes that you get, they used to be a euro. Now they're going to be closer to two euros when you go down sure. to. Oh, I sure am glad I brought a whole lot of coffee back. <laughs> I wonder how the Italians say grev. You know, what, what's their word for striking? Because I feel like that's going <laughs> to come. They're going right to strike over coffee. Yeah. 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 No, um, I don't. I mean, Jonathan says there's not another country in Europe that has as good a tax treaty. That's for sure. Not at all. No, yeah. Nowhere close. Yeah. Um, now, one of the questions, there's actually two questions that touched on EU nationality. Um, we see this a lot. There's a lot of folks who have or, um, origins of Irish or Italian. Those are the two biggest um, players where someone has a grandparent or a parent and they can get uh, European nationality. And then there's a funny thing where they walk into France and they kind of feel like they're breaking the rules. They're like, so it's we're cool, right? Like, you're fine with me being here. You know, I'm one of you. We're your European. And the answer is yes. So um, it's the easiest administration for a European for, or a person with the EU passport, if that feels better to say it that way, to move to France. Uh, it's just like a Californian moving to Arizona. You just show up. And there's very little by way of formalities that an EU national has to do when they get here. They just have to declare their presence to the local town hall, the Mary, to say, I'm here. And then they say, oh, okay, great, you're here. We'll let you vote in local and EU-wide elections. And that we're gonna count your head, just know how many heads are in our neighborhood for us to get enough taxes. And if you don't contact the local town hall, they just assume, assume you haven't been here for 30 for 90 days yet. So, and then you just go ahead and contact the town hall. And there's no need to go to the local prefecture and get a residency permit. Um, so, and the cool thing is then you could sponsor your spouse. So this is my last residency permit card before I became French with a spouse of an EU national. It's up to five years, it's free, it includes all form of work authorization. Um, so it's very advantageous. It's just hard to get, but that's a different story. Um, so it's very advantageous to make your way into France if you have become a national or your spouse has. 
I see a question here about establishing residency in a tax-free state, which, um, uh, I, and that's, and we were talking about that earlier too, because that's really smart. If before you move to France, you establish residency mm -hmm. in a U.S. tax-free state, then you really will end up paying less tax by living in France. Um, and if you take Florida, for example, it's also a, a state that has the re reciprocity with the driving license. So there's an advantage to that too, even though I'm not sure I'd want to be resident in Florida. <laughs> I don't know. We could use a couple extra voters down there. Things have swung a little bit in the last uh, election. So. That is true. That is true. Just register to vote before you come back over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, Daniel, I see another question about you EU citizens what yeah. about the spouse of an EU citizen yeah that's, to come to France yeah so they're form it's the, it's very weird they're the one category out of all like the roughly 30 visa categories they just show up as tourists here into France and then once on French territory within 90 days of arrival they have to uh, contact the local prefecture the filing's now done online Thank goodness, because there's 95 départements and 95 different prefectures, and they all have their own sauce on how to file for spouse at EU National up until about 2022, and then they nationalize it, put it all online. Um, but the trick of it is that because you're entering as a tourist, it's really awkward because you're here, you filed for it. They go, okay, we got your thing. But we haven't processed it yet, so we, don't, we can't give you a good immigration status until we process it. And so it could very well be that they take months and months and months to process this spouse at EU National category. And in the meantime, you're like, well, I want to travel. I want to be able to come and go as I please. Am I going to get in trouble at the border? Um, it's, it's disconcerting because they didn't give you a good enough document to prove that you filed because they moved online. When it's back in person, they would give you a document called the RACBC, which is a temporary residency permit that would give you proof of your legal situation while the processing is ongoing. Um, but that's the category that they go for. And it's far and away the best, the, I consider it the, the fourth best status to have here in France behind being, being French, being EU, uh, EU national, having a 10 year card and having that five year staff at EU national. Um, so when when you're in process and if they, if they have control of your passport, I had a client this week asking me about this and they were doing that. They were processing their um, citizenship, EU citizenship. And there would be, and I think they're your client actually, but they, so the passport would be held, okay? But they're going to give you some sort of a document so that you can travel, right? So you're not stuck. Well, um, you can always ask from a consulate for, in French, they call it a carte consulaire, like a consular card that like acts like a placeholder for, um, okay. for passports. On the U.S. side, I've never seen this actually be a problem. When you file from abroad in the United States uh, for, out of the VFS offices, and there's nine of them in the U.S., to get your French visa, yes, they do hold on to your visa and your passport, I'm sorry. Right. But it typically takes them three weeks to process an application. It takes them eight days to process the visitor visa. So you just lay low for eight days in America, you get your passport back, and then you're free to travel. And once you're here in France, you hold on to your passport when you do the renewals with the local prefecture. So you're not rendering your passport. And right. it might only be when you're dealing with the U.S. Embassy getting a new passport that there might be some kind of errors in like the timing of it. But um, you're actually technically allowed to renew your passport as early as you want. There's no like window of time when you can start to renew your U.S. Mm -hmm. passport here in France with the U.S. Embassy in Paris. Wait, wait, you, a U.S. passport you can actually renew at any point? Yeah, yeah. it's weird. If, let's say there's nine and a half years left on it. You, you can, can ask for it to be renewed. Well, that's interesting because maybe you want to get rid of some of those stamps. <laughs> <laughs> we, and we fall back into things that Daniel cannot say. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, that's your rule to say, it, Adrian. <laughs> well, I was asking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what else, Pat. You see any other great questions? Oh. Uh oh. What percentage of American retirees end up returning to the U.S. for various I reasons versus staying in France forever? I don't know. I, 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 I wanted to um, say something on that. I don't know the answer to what percentage of people go back, but I did read something way back when that said it's harder for people to reacclimate to reentering America than it is for them to move into France. Absolutely. That mm -hmm. is absolutely mm -hmm. true. I the agree. only people I know who have moved back are people who have Either they've come here for a very short period of time and the cultural clash is too acute and they just can't handle it. 
or they've been here forever and their kids are having grand, uh, children and they want to be near their grandkids. Other mm -hmm. than that, nobody goes back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see very, very few that go back. I think it's a bit of a self-selection bias that if you're 50 and you're saying, you know what, here's my second lease on life, I'm moving to France, that that's now the chapter. You know, you put your emotional eggs in the basket of investing in the French language, uh, picking out which neighborhood in France you want to be in. Is it Paris? Is it Nice? Is it Montpellier? Um, and those who do, I'd say, ricochet off of France are the ones that didn't invest enough in the language. I think it does boil down to language. I think as we as Americans could be better at languages. But um, that if you want to feel like you belong in France, the best meal ticket towards that is working on your French, making it be as good as it can be. And it can always be better. Um, and it might be that you just don't feel like you fit in and it could be just a language question. But that's a vast majority of my clients stay because life's pretty cool here in France. But Daniel, I'm, I'm going to only... Uh, uh argue that point because if you're living in a city like Paris or a city like Nice where there's an, a huge American community the truth is you could live here forever without any French at all yeah uh, I was doing a little count off in my head there's you could go to church the American cathedral or the American uh, church or there's also an American Jewish congregation uh, you could give birth at the American hospital you could read books right. at the American library exactly. you could have a class at the American University Exactly. Uh, we've certainly carved out a nice little jacuzzi of warm water in the cold water of France, where you That's kind of right. just be insular, That's have right. a very American network here. Of course, a lot of our folks that come to us don't actually ask for that. They don't want to, if they want to live in America, they'd stay in America, you know. But it is a comfort to know that there's that historical American expat community that lives here in France uh, that goes back to include James Baldwin uh, and, then, you know, not. Justin Baker and so forth. Yeah, but it's not like living in America. It's because it's a very particular America. I mean, Americans who live here are a particular birds of a feather. It's a very particular part of America. And it's a different kind of community than if you're living anywhere else in the U.S. You know, if you're living in cities like L.A. or New York and you've got your little, you know, your little liberal bubble. Right. It's kind of like that. Yeah. Um, and so uh, and I contend that you really can make more friends in such a short amount of time here than you had in your whole life in the U S because of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's really easy to fit in and yeah. feel comfortable. Or, or if you wanted to frame it in a different way, it's America with a lot of the values that you wanted to see put into place, put in place. So, you know, uh, school is mandatory and free starting at age three. So, you know, that's, you know, that's free pre-K that healthcare is a human right. I asked my wife this uh, at lunchtime, if she'd ever did a, a, like a school shooting drill and she's she was like horrified by the question <laughs> and I was like yeah yeah okay good it's good that we're raising a kid here in France and we could basically feel safe about you know the safety side of things there's no metal so, detectors to enter school uh-uh no right and so um yeah so on a certain level it might be and a lot of the clients that we get are California and a lot of the values that people when they move here to France are aligned with um you know progressive values and so it's a lot of those progressive values put into place and so that's maybe part of the reason why they make that move. I want to say I want to say one other advantage that I've discovered over the years, and that is that among the American community, the American community does not see color or religion or anything of that. If you're an American, it doesn't matter if you're white, black or pink. Nobody cares. I mean, those lines just are not drawn. And it's it's one of the biggest advantages that I've seen to living within the American community mm -hmm. in France. And I'll add, no one cares how much money you have. Oh, that's the other thing. It's it's because it's not about that at all. Mm -mm. Nobody cares. Mm -mm. And so it really changes your whole perspective on life mm -hmm. in, every, in every way, shape and form. Mm -hmm. And when you say no one cares about the money, it's because life's affordable here that, you know, a studio in Paris might cost 1200 euros and that, there's no. just no difference between there's, those who are really wealthy and can afford that and those who have come over as and students and living just, in, Yeah, just, there just seems to not be that peer competition about, oh, you live in a certain neighborhood or you live in a studio, you don't live in this big house. That just I haven't run across anybody caring where you lived, what you had, anything like that. It just doesn't matter. Mm. You can, if you're part and somebody, of community, somebody you're just part asked of... a question about LGBT people. Absolutely. Same, same yeah. thing. Does not matter. Yeah. 
there was a there was a woman in Paris. She's no longer alive, but she used to run. She started in the late early nineties, a group called the African American Literary Soirees, and okay, it was designed you know for the African American community. But when all the honkies showed up, she had to drop that name because it was ridiculous. I mean, she wasn't going to stop <laughs> Americans from coming. Period. It and so she ended up. Yeah, it was just for Americans. That's all it was. Mm -hmm. And I. I um, remember that but what i what i will say because you're saying kind of about how this could be a great equalizer moving here to france one of my uh wealthier clients took a pretty small apartment by the luxembourg gardens and uh, i was kind of surprised that it was so small but what i find positive when you move to france is and when you move to paris in particular is that you don't necessarily need to have the world's biggest apartment because the glory of paris is in the streets and the cafes and the you know the exactly. market and, so forth. and that's a public good that we're all you know collectively owning so you, you don't necessarily need to have the world's biggest apartment if you're living here in Paris because you might not stay in your apartment all day long. You might be getting out and making the most of Paris. That's why, that's why you don't need a big apartment. You're not going to be in it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> is, that you small, is that how you sell small apartments, Adrian? <laughs> we sell every size. <laughs> <laughs> every size, but it, and our clients are of every, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they, you know, whether it's a... Uh, Chambre de Bonne or a mansion. No, doesn't matter. We, everyone gets treated equally. That's the whole point. And, and I think that's also part of just living inside of a socialist democracy. It's a lot more equalized in every way. Mm -hmm. But especially among the American community, the differences just aren't acute. And it's really a pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, we are down to the last few minutes. So should we see if there's any really pertinent questions? Because we've kind of gotten off topic a little bit. And Brian's been quiet. Brian's been quiet. You guys are hitting all the uh, the, the most important parts. Oh, um, there's, oh, go ahead, Brian. Oh, no. yeah, Patty, please. Um, no, there was another um, EU, EU passport related question for Daniel. If yeah. my wife has an Irish passport, can I work in France as an artist or consultant? Yeah. So the beautiful thing about this passport, your national residency permit, is it includes full-on work authorization. And so then once one obtains that status, you could then work as an uh, entrepreneur, an employee, part-time employee. Mm -hmm. um, the starter pack default corporate structure here in France, if you're being an entrepreneur, is called the micro-entreprise, micro-entreprise. And um, that's a really good vehicle to run your operation. And then whether you're an artist or consultant or whatever, you bill it here in France, you pay social charges on the French side, you pay taxes on the French side, and you're, you're tax compliant. Great. Wow. Okay. But we all know that if you're an American and you're working for American companies or working remotely, that you can actually still work in France, even if you don't have the right to work in France. There are just, there are ways of, it's all about the taxation and there are definitely ways to do that. Correct? Yeah. And that is the, um, the, the reason why we had a call, all of us, um, about six months ago about this matter to confirm what the, um, the you know, the policy is and the French consulate and the uh, ministry of the interior and the french prefectures have confirmed in writing that they allow teleworking on the visitor status and of course there's more nuances to that so if you wanted to dive into the legal complications of that visitor visa and teleworking matters we're always here to discuss that uh, aspect oh yeah we well and we talk to our clients about that all the time but i don't want people to be fearful that they don't won't be able to actually sit in france and do what they do and work and earn mm -hmm. money that there's really lots of great ways around that yeah. Anybody have anything you want to say before we say so long? Brian, can you just unpack PFIX and FBAR? Because you mentioned at the start, and maybe that was uh, some acronyms people wanted to get unpacked. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, as, essentially, these are all the acronyms that go together with the FATCA uh, accords that have made things harder. Um, PFIX are essentially whenever you own a security outside of the United States. Um, my firm, we help uh, uh, provide financial advice for Americans that are in France, and we'll typically always want the assets to be held in the United States to avoid owning any of these PFIX, a passive foreign investment company. Um, this just makes it so that we're able to pay all the tax on the U.S. side, but also we're avoiding punitive tax um, from the American side if we had a PFIC. Um, so that would be an assurance V or the typical ones that are sold there in France um, and uh, uh, become quite punitive. Um, F bars 
are when we're actually holding uh, assets abroad. So if your bank account and all of your bank accounts in aggregate are worth over $10,000, um, then you're going to have to do an FBAR filing. This is essentially going to the Treasury, not the IRS. So it has nothing to do with tax. It's all to try to prevent money laundering. But it's a little bit of a pain actually having to put them together. Um, so if you have a lot of money abroad, make sure that you're filing that on an annual basis to avoid any, any punishments in any way, shape, or form. Um, to kind of summarize what we've really been talking about today, which is uh, your American citizenship, there's tons of legal financial um, ramifications. And I think what Daniel and, and Adrian did a wonderful job at, at articulating was the emotional consequences of potentially relinquishing uh, a, a, a citizenship or even better, aggregating a citizenship or uh, a residency over in France. And gosh, every single time that I sit on one of these calls with Adrian, I think to myself, what am I doing here in London? So <laughs> yes, that's what we want to know, Brian. <laughs> what are you doing in London? Oh, um, you're so doing business, is what you're doing. We, we're we're having some fun over here, but I gotta get I gotta get myself over there a little bit more often. Well, you're gonna. I know you're gonna come down to Antibes. We we are gonna be down there. Um, we've got we've got some people that we're gonna be meeting down there. Um, in uh, for sure at the beginning of November, um, and uh, uh, hopefully even more times than that. So it's 801. So we're over time. I want to thank everybody on mm -hmm. this uh, webinar. I want to thank everyone for participating, all you uh, viewers out there. Daniel, fantastic insight as usual. Um, mm -hmm. Brian, it, same. Th Patty, thank you for monitoring. And um, the next one, the next forum before we leave is November 21st. And I'm going to be on from Hawaii, from Maui. So no backdrop for you, Adrian. Well, I'm going to, no, in that backdrop, I'm going to put palm trees. <laughs> Adrian, thank you so much for hosting today. Uh, always fascinating always. insight. Daniel, I could listen to you all day and then I'd end up with uh, an extra passport. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, working, I'm working on mine with him. Um, if you haven't checked it out, make sure to check out Daniel's YouTube station uh, because Adrian is his last guest. Was it last guest or a couple times before? Yeah, I filmed uh, a bunch of videos last December and then I've been sprinkling them out bit by bit. But yeah, I just put out a video, um, how to buy a property in France, which complements a couple of other videos, how to befriend the French um, and how what does it mean to become French? So some fun. I haven't guys. seen it yet. Well, <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Adrian, because we'll include the link to it in the follow-up email to this. Thank as well you. As to your wonderful YouTube channel, because there's a bunch of amazing content on both channels. Mm -hmm. On all of on all of ours, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful thank you, everybody. rest of the day. Bye. Bye. Au revoir.